And welcome to our Zoom folks who are trickling in. I think we're good to get started. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone to the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society um, and our Institute for Rebooting Social Media at Harvard University. My name is Tony Gardner and I direct operations for our institutes. And today I have the honor of welcoming you all and our folks on Zoom, um, our esteemed panelists, and introducing our moderator and organizer for today's event, Professor Anupam Chander. Anupam Chander is a visiting scholar with the Institute for Rebooting Social Media and the Scott K. Ginsburg Professor of Law and Technology at Georgetown. A graduate of Harvard College and Yale Law School, he is the author of a number of books, including a new book on data sovereignty just out from Oxford University Press. He has been a visiting law professor at Yale, Chicago, and Stanford, and is a member of the American Law Institute. Over to you, Anna Palm. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, I'm honored to introduce the panel. Um, and before I do that, I want to just kind of bring you up to speed on where we are with TikTok bans past and present. Um, so in 2020, Donald Trump famously and dramatically banned TikTok. Uh, but instead of Trump banning TikTok, by the following spring, it was TikTok that had banned Trump, removing various videos involved, it, showing his involvement with January 6th. Um, so how did a Chinese a big tech app, big tech, uh, company or a Chinese origin big tech company uh, beat the president of the United States on his home turf. Uh, it was the U.S. courts that stepped in to protect TikTok uh, the, and TikTok's users in particular. The courts concluded that the president lacked statutory authority to ban this cross-border speech app. Uh, there are still a couple spaces up here if anyone wants to uh, just come to the front. Uh, the, uh, the ban, uh, the government's efforts to convince the courts that national security required the ban to go into effect failed to convince two district judges, including a Trump appointee, uh, who concluded that they were conjectural uh, and could possibly be met with other measures. But TikTok's troubles were far from over. Uh, it began negotiating earnestly with CFIUS, a committee of, in the United States government that reviews foreign investments that present possible national security concerns. TikTok, to, uh, to negotiate with uh, Asifius, offered to place all of its U US, U.S. user data inside servers held in the U.S. and controlled and managed by Oracle, a company whose leaders have coincidentally supported Donald Trump in the 2020 uh, election. Uh, TikTok's algorithm would be monitored and vetted closely by Oracle and others, uh, and the board of directors of the TikTok data security arm, with the arm that held all the data and controlled the algorithm, would be approved by the U.S. government. Okay. A remarkable uh, kind of landscape for, uh, for uh, a speech app in the United States. Those efforts continued to this day, and CFIUS hasn't yet ordered again a divestiture or accepted uh, TikTok's Project Texas plan to mitigate those risks. Now, where Trump's ban failed um, for lack of statutory authorization, a bill in Congress today would fix at least that deficit. That bill, proposed by Congressman Mike Gallagher and joined by Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy, would clearly direct ByteDance to either sell TikTok and its other US-facing apps or face an effective ban in the United States. So while that bill is concerned with both the use of TikTok for surveillance and propaganda uh, in conversations with the press, Congressman Gallagher has said that he's especially concerned with propaganda. Uh, and from the app. And in November of last year, Congressman Gallagher blamed TikTok for pushing Chinese propaganda and radicalizing Gen Z on the app. Uh, kind of an interesting uh, 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 interpretation of recent events. Uh, the bill, which passed the US House in seemingly record time, 
and with overwhelming margins is now before the US Senate for consideration. Well, the bill's proponents say that it's not a ban, it's only compelling a sale, they can't be sure that it won't lead to the shuttering of the app in the United States. This is because in 2020, China modified its export controls to add to the technologies subject to export controls, personalization algorithms. So algorithms that would make recommendations based on uh, personal information thereby kind of hinting that it would ban the sale of TikTok uh, should that arise, should that be compelled. Now, ByteDance also may itself prefer to shut down the US market, this is not talked about, uh, rather than create a future competitor in a, at a fire sale price. So ByteDance itself uh, is, has a TikTok app that operates across the world. It would now have to face the difficult situation of not only having already bifurcated its China-facing app, uh, Douyin, but now bifurcating TikTok into multiple apps uh, that uh, that try that, and with uh, obviously interoperability questions that would be uh, potentially difficult. Um, here's coming to the rescue is uh, Trump's former Treasury Secretary Steve Nugent. Uh, Steve Newton is assembling a group to buy TikTok, and he has a solution for the Chinese government's veto. He proposes to buy TikTok without the algorithm. Okay, uh, and so his proposal is to recreate an algorithm in the United States from from the ground up. Uh, and so uh, now that the TikTok bill uh, has passed the House. I might also note that this is Congressman Gallagher's valedictory. Uh, next week, he will resign from the US House to join Palantir, uh, a defense contractor for the United States government uh, that interestingly has, a, has its first one of its first initial investments from the venture capital arm of the CIA. And I kid you not. Okay, you would not have expected that there, those words coming out of that. That is the reality. Uh, so our panel will consider what happens if a TikTok bill is passed and signed into law. Both TikTok and its users will sue, uh, arguing that the bill violates the First Amendment. Um, and the bill interestingly places original jurisdiction over challenges in any challenges to the bill, which are, will will immediately happen, of course. Uh, in the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, that is the only possible appeal from that original court will be directly to the US Supreme Court. So this is very much an issue that could well be before the court that's coming uh, uh, in, the, in the months to come, um, before the US Supreme Court, I mean to say. So the TikTok saga is kind of like, as they wrote this, yeah, I realize it's kind of like a Hollywood drama. Uh, and its final scene may well lie at the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and joining me today to explain the issue, so what we're trying to do with this particular conversation is focus on what happens in those courts, okay? Ask that particular question. What happens to the First Amendment challenge that will inevitably file, be filed if TikToks, if the TikTok bill goes through? So we have some leading experts uh, from across the nation uh, joining us here to, to uh, explain these questions and to think through how the courts will reason uh, this issue. Uh, first, to my immediate left is Jennifer Huddleston, a fellow at the Cato Institute. Um, this happens to be a very nice opportunity to, uh, uh, to host Jennifer, but I'm also uh, hoping that we can join uh, in helping support Jennifer because on Monday, she'll be running the Boston Marathon. Oh. <laughs> uh, this is good to be her 12th marathon or half marathon as I understand. 12th oh. full, full, full marathon uh, and her Time, her average time is uh, an eight minute mile uh, for, so just shocking uh, to, uh, for, for me, I, 
I can't do one mile, let alone 26. Uh, to her left is Ramya Krishnan, a uh, senior staff attorney at the Knight First Amendment Institute and a lecturer in law at Columbia Law School. And uh, finally, to my uh, far left is Jenna Leventhoff, a senior policy counsel at the ACLU, where she develops and advocates for policies relating to protecting free speech. Um, and on screen, joining us from Minnesota, is, uh, is a law professor at the University of Minnesota and a senior editor at Lawfare, Professor Alan Rosenstein. Uh, Alan is a graduate of this very law school and a former fellow at Berkman. Uh, so with that introduction, uh, I wanted to, uh, I'm gonna go around and ask them questions and there will be time for uh, questions from the audience and there will even be time for questions from the, uh, the Zoom audience. So I want to encourage you to uh, think about your questions. Um, and we're doing this very much uh, for lawyers. And so this is, you know, we are uh, going to focus on the questions that lawyers ask in, in such a uh, conversation. So I'll begin with a threshold question. Um, and uh, the threshold question that a court will ask is what is the standard of review? Uh, so in the Montana case, the district court applied intermediate scrutiny, uh, finding the TikTok ban to be wanted even under that standard. Um, it said it didn't need to decide whether or not that was the appropriate level of scrutiny because it would fail under uh, intermediate scrutiny it would offer sure or I fail under strict scrutiny. Um, and so I want to ask Jenna first, um, what is the appropriate standard of review in this case? I think the appropriate standard is actually even more than strict scrutiny. This is a prior restraint. This is stopping the speech of 170 million Americans before they can say anything. And in so many cases, that's worse than, you know, what we traditionally just deter speech because it's not, in that case, your view can be and then you're punished later. In this case, your view is never getting out there to begin with. It is the most strict, like speech restricted thing that you can possibly do. And so when Supreme Court has looked at prior restraints like this, where again, you're just stopping speech before it starts, they say they're gonna presumptively fail a constitutional analysis, right? The government has to go so far above what it normally goes for. So they have to show that there's an immediate harm. They have to show that that harm is extremely serious. And then not only does it need to be narrowly a narrowly tailored solution, but it pretty much needs to be um, necessary. It needs to be a necessary solution, right? Like, is this the only thing that you can do to actually solve the problem? And in this case, it's going to fail. <laughs> this is not going to meet that analysis because I think the government has yet to put forth any public evidence that there is a real harm, let alone an immediate one. But even if we got to that point, right? Like, even if the government came out, um, I know on, in Congress they're talking about doing a public briefing, many members of Congress have gotten private briefings about what the potential harms are. Um, and if you ask a lot of those members, they'll say, I haven't heard any things that I find particularly convincing about an imminent harm. This seems theoretical, but some members do seem convinced that there is a real harm. So even if that comes out, where we're gonna fail here on these bans is being the least restrictive thing. What is this doing? It's shutting down the app, essentially. Um, and there's really no way to do that in advance. Like that is speech restrictive in and of itself. And there's so many other things that we could do to target any of these harms. We could pass a privacy bill right now. Like let's say the concern is that China is accessing our data, right? Uh, well, China can still access our data even if TikTok is banned. <laughs> they can get data from a data broker. They can hack into Facebook's system. Like every other app and website collects the same data. And so we're not doing very much here to like actually solve the problem. Okay, so Alan, I'm gonna to come to you. Um, Jenna says this is even more than strict scrutiny. It's, a, it's obviously a prior restraint. It's shutting off access to speech, uh, an incredibly important speech platform for something like 170 million people in the United States. Uh, and um, and then let, you, before coming to the substance of, of that, you know, applying whatever the standard of review is, what is that appropriate standard of review from your perspective? 
Sure. So to be perfectly honest, I'm I'm not sure. I feel like I can argue it many different ways. And you know, it's a common problem in First Amendment jurisprudence is is these sort of endless arguments about what the appropriate standard of, of review is. So let, let me say two things. So first, with respect to what the actual standard of review is, I think, again, I think you can make arguments sort of up and down the spectrum. So we just heard the argument for a prior restraint. That, I think that's very plausible. Um, on the other hand, I think there are lots of potentially analogous cases where we wouldn't apply that kind of standard. So for example, an FCC denial of a license, right? I don't think you would apply necessarily a prior restraint uh, standard, right? That would keep someone, for example, out of the communications market. So again, I think it just depends exactly sort of how you characterize the issue. And there's a lot of play in the doctrinal joints, as it were. Um, you could potentially characterize it as uh, viewpoint based if you know your concern is that the Chinese Communist Party is pushing a particular viewpoint, um, then you might characterize this ban uh, or this law that way, and that would obviously be a high level of uh, scrutiny. You could just characterize it as a content based law, um, which is to say the content is Chinese propaganda, if that's how you want to characterize it, and that would be strict scrutiny. Or you could characterize it the way that the, uh, the Montana court did as a, a more neutral, something analogous to time, place, and manner, in which case you have intermediate scrutiny. And then, of course, we haven't even talked about the national security implications, which um, I think tweak all of these tiers of scrutiny, or at least how the courts uh, analyze them. So I, I think this foundational question is very much open. But the second thing I want to say is, and not to get sort of too legal realist five minutes into the conversation, um, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure the, um, the fight over the tiers of scrutiny here will ultimately matter in the long term. Um, I think these sorts of distinctions are quite important when lower courts are trying to slot a fact pattern into well-established body of First Amendment law. But I think there are two reasons why that's probably not the case here. First, although this isn't sui generis, right, as I'm sure we'll talk about uh, later on in the conversation, there's a long history, um, and we can sort of debate the specific parameters of that history, of uh, restrictions on foreign ownership of platforms. This sort of um, move is, I think, quite unusual. There's not like a massive amount of case law um, here. Um, in addition, um, as you pointed out, Anupam, um, this litigation will start in the DC circuit and then it will almost certainly, I would imagine, be reviewed by the Supreme Court. This is such an important issue um, that it's hard to imagine the Supreme Court, which I think to its credit in the last few years has shown a real willingness to engage with a whole host of internet related platform issues that it's generally not um, in the past that will take on. And once you get to the Supreme Court, I don't think the tiers of scrutiny play any role whatsoever. Um, I think at the Supreme Court, you have nine policymakers who are going to be balancing the various equities here um, as they see it. Um, and so, um, you know, while again, I, I think asking the tiers of scrutiny question is, is, a, is a good place to start, um, at the end of the day, I, I don't think that this is, um, that that's going to be determinative of how the doctrine ends up uh, playing out in this litigation. Uh, I love the idea. The Supreme Court has nine policymakers balancing various interests um, as they as they uh, judge this, um, and it reminds me of uh, uh, Justice Kagan, formerly uh, Dean Kagan, uh, saying that they are hardly the nine most brilliant people about expert people about the internet. Uh, so uh, fascinating uh, to to imagine. Um, okay, so. Uh, Let's turn to one of these questions that has already been uh, mentioned. Many of the defenders of TikTok bill argue that it doesn't actually impose a ban. It simply requires ByteDance to find new owners, okay? uh, ones without ties to a nation that has been identified as a foreign adversary. So this is a little of that national security question uh, teed up uh, that Alan has, has uh, uh, suggested. Of course, the bill would impose a ban if ByteDance doesn't do this. Does it matter for the first one analysis that the bill isn't an immediate ban order, but rather I divest, or if you don't divest, then you're banned? And Jennifer, I'm going to come to you first. So yes, it does matter, um, in part because it's going to go back to the, are there less effective means to achieve this goal? So clearly a Forced sale or divestiture, while very concerning for many reasons that I'm guessing we'll have some time to go into from a, a speech point of view, is a very restrictive means. A full out ban would be a more restrictive means. But the question is, what else exists on that spectrum before you get to something like a forced sale or divestiture? And I also think it matters how this forced sale or divestiture must occur. Because we're talking not just about 
a small company that doesn't have many users. It's a small transaction or something like that. We're talking about a very large transaction in a very short period of time, but also has to clear some additional regulatory hurdles, not only because likely of the, the size of the transaction, but because of what else is in the bill. It has to be proven that this satisfies, that this um, alleviates concerns about the, the foreign interest. So are there certain buyers that the government might potentially strike down? There are all sorts of other elements of how this divestiture must occur that does not mean that it's as simple as sometimes advocates of this bill make it out to be of like TikTok, they just go down to the on the corner and offer itself up for sale. These are complicated business transactions, but there's only going to be certain people that can, can uh, potentially participate in. Now, why this matters from a First Amendment analysis is a lot of us can sit here and think, well, what else could be done? If we do say that the government has a national security interest, is this the least restrictive means on speech or are there other steps that could be taken? We've seen some of these play out in courts at a, a state level as well with regards to, for example, banning TikTok from government devices or government networks. The idea that if there is a national security concern, it shouldn't be on government devices, it shouldn't be on government networks. That has generally withstood um, the challenge in the Texas courts, I know. And in many cases, we haven't seen as much challenge to that kind of ban, uh, ban that's much more narrowly tailored to a particular situation. On the other end, you have something like the Trump executive order that's a much more flat out ban. But you also have other things in between. You mentioned Project Texas. That would be an example of something that would perhaps be less restrictive. We could think of something where Congress, for example, could mandate a warning label that says this app is known to have ties to China. Again, there are many First Amendment concerns with such a proposal, but it's probably less restrictive than a forced divestiture. We can think of other steps that could have been taken. So I think it will matter when it comes to identifying if this is the least restrictive means to achieve Congress's goal, which is not always clear what even that national security concern is. By the way, the privacy bills that have been proposed in Congress do actually have uh, a disclosure requirement for data transfer to China. Uh, so this the latest bill uh, that is in Congress, uh, like the, the the bipartisan bill that was proposed last year. So there's an interesting alternative that's before Congress right now. Uh, Ramya, any thoughts on the? The, the posture where this is a bill that says divest, and if you can't if you can't divest for some reason, then you're banned, as opposed to an outright ban. How does that change or affect the analysis, or does it? So um, I'm going to get a little bit realist, like Alan Pierre. I'm not sure in practice how much distance there is between an order to divest or be banned and a flat out ban. Um, because we know uh, that China would have to approve any deal and it is on record that it will very likely firmly oppose any such deal. That's what its uh, commerce spokesperson said when last year uh, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, CFIUS, when, it's, um, when it told TikTok to divest or be banned, um, its China spokesperson came out and said, well, actually, we're going to have a problem with this. And that's when they noted also that um, they would have to keep the export um, of uh, by dancers algorithm, the algorithm that TikTok runs on. Um, and so that's what that's why analysts have said that it's very, very unlikely that a uh, that a divestiture deal uh, will be accomplished here. And so what we're staring down the barrel of is uh, almost certainly uh, a ban. Uh, I, but the other thing that I would mention is as a matter of sort of First Amendment doctrine is that generally speaking, the government is not meant to be able to do indirectly what it can't do uh, directly. And here, uh, the government would be using the threat of the ban uh, in order to accomplish a divestiture. And I think that that should matter for the purposes of the analysis. There is this uh, threat of a ban um, being held over a company in order to achieve the divestiture. 
Uh, if I could just sort of uh, respond, though, um, to something that, that Jennifer said that's unrelated to that question, but um, how we should look at certain less restrictive alternatives, uh, like, for example, the, the many state laws we've seen that have imposed uh, a ban on state employees uh, accessing uh, TikTok on state-owned or operated uh, devices and a little bit self-interest advised here because as one of the litigators who litigated that um, that Texas case, the case challenging the application of Texas's state employee ban to public university faculty engaged in teaching and research. And so I just do want to highlight that um, at least, you know, the application of those kinds of bans to the public university context, I think does raise um, serious First Amendment concerns. There are faculty that are uh, engaged in the study of TikTok. Many of them focus on the very uh, privacy and security risks that these states um, have said they care about and, and, and have offered as a reason that they have, have passed this ban um, in, in the first place. Students' interest in learning uh, about one of the most popular communications platforms is also implicated. And so I would just want to sort of push back against the idea that those bans never raise First Amendment consent. I think they do. If I can just clarify really quick, I, I am not saying that they do not raise First Amendment concerns. It is more of a, when we're thinking about what are less restrictive means, we've already seen some of those less restrictive means play out. There certainly are First Amendment concerns in many of the things that I, I mentioned, for example, of a warning label or even some of the, the data localization requirements, there could be certain other concerns um, related to that. But I think it's important that when we see what a sizable step the divestor ban would be, I think we both agree that that is a significantly more restrictive means than what we've seen play out so far. So Alan, does it matter how the bill is styled as a outright ban versus a divestor order uh, coupled with a ban if divestiture doesn't occur? I think it does. I, I agree with both Jennifer and Remy here sort of simultaneously, and so I'll try to explain why. So I agree with Jennifer that it, it does matter, right? It, there's just a difference between saying this thing is banned versus this thing might be banned, but it might not also not be banned if there's a divestment. On the other hand, I think Remy is correct that based on everything we know about the sort of geopolitics of this, if this law is passed uh, and the president, you know, there, then and, uh, identifies TikTok sort of under the law, um, this will likely lead to TikTok's ban. And I do think that defenders of the law have to be prepared for that. And so I think you do have to uh, uh, accept that possibility. Nevertheless, though, I actually think the divestment option is clever for another reason, which is that if China refuses to divest or allow ByteDance to divest, um, I think that actually then strengthens the national security case for the law itself, because it shows um, how valuable uh, the Chinese government perceives um, TikTok's role in the United States is. Now, so at the end of the day, I think Ramya is, is correct that, you know, if this is going to be defended, it's going to have to ultimately de be defended as a ban. Um, but I also think Jennifer is correct in that there's a lot of cleverness in adding the divestment option. Great, great. Thank you, guys. Um, so um, uh, I do think, by the way, it, um, there is something that someone we haven't mentioned yet, uh, just to add a little editorial commentary quickly. Um, when Twitter passed hands from um, from the shareholders of Alta before to Elon, uh, from the public shareholders and its leadership, uh, that made a big difference. Um, and so Twitter's content changed. So the divestiture order itself uh, should have, we should think of that as having First Amendment implications, uh, even before we get to a ban. So it's not just the ban that you can't use this act, but that it has to be run by someone else. That's a pretty substantial First Amendment uh, uh, intrusion in my, in my personal view. Okay. Uh, I'll let anyone else uh, respond to that if you want to. Sorry. So I don't get the last word. Claim the last word here. Well, the only other thing I would point out about this is we keep talking about this in the context of TikTok, and I think that's because TikTok is named in the bill um, that that has this divestor ban provision that you mentioned. But if you look at that legislation, it's actually broader than just TikTok. So we have to think not only what does this mean for this current debate, but what does this mean more generally 
four apps that could be determined by the government to fall under this category? And what does that mean more broadly for the way we see not only government interaction in this market, but also government intervention into potential speech apps in the future? And I want to yeah. just kind of clarify what you were saying, which is what this bill says, is that the president can unilaterally decide that if there is another app that is owned by a foreign adversary, the president can ban it. There's no due process. The president has to give notice to Congress and notice to the public. And that is it. There, there is no I have to clarify when it's when the bill set talks about foreign controlled apps, it means an app that has ownership that or 20% or more that originates from a foreign country that is labeled an adversary. That doesn't mean that the that the government of that country owns uh, part of that app. It means that there are, in this case, Chinese citizens that might have 20% ownership of the app. Uh, and so that's the way. So in other words, the wide swath of, of companies that might actually come into the scope of being foreign controlled apps. And as Janice points out, the president can unilaterally declare those apps to be a threat to the United States with very limited challenges available uh, to, and, and very limited publication of what the ra rationale is, uh, very little scrutiny of what is uh, the basis for that, uh, that claim, and a uh, and, and few challenges that might be available for that designation. Okay, let me move on to uh, 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 conversation between a congressman and PBS News. Uh, the congressman says, we would never have allowed CBS to be owned by the Soviet Union in the 1960s. Um, and indeed, of course, going back to the Radio Act and the Communications Act, and Alan already referenced this in his remarks, we've had restrictions on foreign investment in broadcasting. Um, how would this history of restraints on foreign investment affect the analysis? Alan, I'm going to turn to you first. Sure. So I think it should affect it somewhat, but not too much. And what I mean by that is just because we've been doing something does not by itself make it constitutional. There are lots of things throughout American history that were done for a long time until the courts came in and said, that's not a constitutional thing to do. So I don't want to overstate the importance of the history here. Um, on the other hand, I, I don't think it means nothing. Um, you know, I think really good work has been done on this by... Um, Ganesh Siddharaman, who's a law professor at Vanderbilt, he wrote a wonderful paper on foreign control of platforms in the Stanford Law Review uh, quite recently. Um, and he goes through this history in a lot of detail. And what's notable, I think, from that history is that um, US restrictions on foreign control of platforms are pervasive, not just in the communications industry, but also in banking and transportation. And then within the communications industry, they go back quite a long way, more than 100 years, back to sort of the original Radio Act of 1912, and then through the various communications revolutions of the 20th century, radio, telegraph, telephone, uh, and uh, and so on. Now, I think it, you know, while well, again, I don't want to overstate the importance of that history, um, I think it's important for at least two reasons, or at least, let me put it this way, I think it strengthens the case for, the, for this law in two ways. Um, first, um, I do think that the way that constitutional provisions are interpreted by the political branches is a important thing for courts to take into account. It is a kind of um, political branch precedent um, that coexists in a certain way with judicial precedent. Um, and I think courts should be appropriately cautious, um, not overly scared, but appropriately cautious about interpreting the constitution in a way that would not only strike down a law passed by the political branches, but would strike what would have the effect of declaring potentially a hundred years of what I think were not particularly controversial restrictions um, as unconstitutional. It's just something for the courts to to think about. Um, you know, these are the considered judgments of the political branches for over a hundred years. Um, the second reason I think the history is important is because I do think it shows that restrictions on foreign control of ownership. Uh, of communications infrastructure in the United States is compatible with a robust communications industry and robust public sphere in the United States. Now, I think you could respond to that by saying, yes, but actually it would have been a good thing. It would have been a better thing if had the Soviet Union wanted to buy CBS in the 1960s or 70s, we would have allowed it because that would have made a better uh, communicative sphere. I happen to disagree with that, but you could make that argument. 
Um, but nevertheless, I think the fact that our communications system has been quite vibrant, despite a history of foreign ownership restrictions, I think further tells you something about uh, this law. Though, again, I want to emphasize, I don't view the history here as in any way clinching one way or the other as to the constitutionality of a bill like this. Great. Thanks, Alan. Jennifer? I think it's an interesting comparison because I also think it shows another element of this discussion that's often underappreciated. And that is what this bill would signal for the regulation of the internet and technology more generally. Because network television has been regulated much more heavily than the internet to the points that Alan just made, because we saw spectrum as a scarce resource. We saw the airwaves as a scarce resource. So it did not have that full First Amendment right. There were more restrictions. There were more regulations on certain elements of broadcast television, as well as on certain elements of broadband today. But when it comes to apps, when it comes to the internet ecosystem, when it comes to the kind of different platforms that we've had for speech online, we haven't seen those same restrictions. And that's part of what actually allowed the US to be a leader in the internet revolution, was the fact that we didn't put many restrictions on the ability to come up with these creative ideas. If anything, we supported platforms in enabling more opportunities for user speech. And that's why the internet has been such a positive tool for user speech. And my concern about when we start to hear comparisons to broadcast television is what that's actually doing is opening the door, not only in this particular case, but more generally to placing much more heavy handed regulation on the internet and particularly on online speech, which has been such a critical tool for so many people who in that broadcast era couldn't have their voices heard. Can I just um, yes. jump, jump in there? I mean, I, I do think that a sort of another relevant point of distinction is that generally those other frameworks they were ex ante, they were sector wide, they generally, you know, uh, involved requiring compliance with sector wide regulatory standards. And a, a reason I think that that matters is sort of the intent behind these frameworks. Um, I, I think that it's been clear from, uh, and I don't know if I'm, you made this point, clear from statements made by uh, the bill sponsors, the bill supporters, that a big motivation for them is that they don't like how. Uh, TikTok is currently being moderated, and they think that an American company would moderate the app differently. You know, they've made some of them have made specific statements about concerns, not necessarily grounded in, in evidence, but suggesting that uh, that the app is sort of artificially amplifying pro Palestinian content at the expense of pro Israel. Uh, content, um, and they would anticipate that an American company would make a different decision, and that. That is generally that kind of content-based purpose, viewpoint-based purpose, is, uh, is is one that we consider anathema to the First Amendment, and I think sort of distinguishes this case and this bill from some of those other frameworks. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, now let's get to the heart of the matter. Would this bill survive uh, the challenge? Uh, let's imagine that it's just tested on intermediate scrutiny. And I hear Alan say, you know, I recall Alan saying the level of scrutiny doesn't matter in practice, but let's let's imagine that uh, the, the form of the opinion will follow uh, the, the uh, a particular standard of scrutiny um, in any case. Um, would a TikTok law pass intermediate scrutiny? In that context, um, that is, does it advance important governmental interests unrelated to the suppression of speech, not burden substantially more speech than necessary to further those interests, and leave ample alternative channels of communication. In this context, I think, you know, we have to keep in mind the possibility of Project Texas as one of these uh, uh, alternative approaches um, that might be relevant to that question. Uh, so I'm going to ask Alan to lead off here. Sure. So I think it would, though I don't pretend that this is any sort of obvious call. Let me distinguish between the two grounds on which this law generally is defended. The first being data privacy, the second being, you can call it propaganda, you can call it, um, this could be information control. 
I do, I'm not a fan of the data privacy um, rationale uh, for this law for reasons that I think uh, Jenna articulated very nicely, which is that uh, the lack of any sort of data privacy protections we have at the federal level means that I do think that if the Chinese Communist Party wants data on U.S. citizens, they will get that data whether or not uh, ByteDance owns TikTok. And I will say before I was a law professor, I worked in national security, the Department of Justice, and I'm the proud owner of multiple lifelong paid for uh, subscriptions to identity protection services, courtesy of the federal government, uh, mm -hmm. because China so thoroughly stole mine and millions of others of my colleagues' uh, data. Um, so I don't find the data pr protection argument particularly uh, compelling. I think it's a compelling interest, um, but I'm not convinced, um, given the real free speech stakes here, which I certainly don't deny, that that, that would work. Um, so that's why I think the law is best defended. And I think that, frankly, folks in Congress should more explicitly defend it on these grounds. And I think they are increasingly doing so um, as avoiding um, Chinese interference in the information space, frankly. Um, I do think that that is a compelling interest. Um, and I do think that this is quite substantially related to uh, that, a, a divestment. Um, you know, TikTok, which is owned by ByteDance, which although is a private company, given everything we know about the way that the Chinese government operates means that ByteDance is ultimately under the control of the Chinese government, in particular Xi Jinping, um, is an enormously important source, not just of you know, fun cat videos, um, but of information, of news uh, for millions and millions of Americans, um, including young Americans. Now, again, that obviously raises profound speech issues, but I think it also very clearly uh, shows the real geostrategic and national security implications of that. Um, we can talk about Project Texas. Um, I think that's an important issue. Um, and I do think that that's something that unfortunately has policymakers have not given enough discussion to. And I think that um, if Congress, if the Senate takes this up and there's some reporting that you know, they might actually, despite a month of sort of being very quiet on the issue, there needs to be a, a record explaining uh, in more detail than was the case in the House why Project Texas, something like that, would be insufficient. Um, I think there are things you can complain about Project Texas, and I think there are even ways in which Project Texas, given how much actually U.S. government involvement it would in, introduce into the day-to-day -day workings of TikTok, is in some sense creates its own First Amendment concerns in a way that just having sort of a TikTok or a TikTok competitor cleanly run by a U.S. or uh, uh, not by China or other uh, foreign countries of concern doesn't propose. So I just I don't want to I, I don't want to concede that Project Tax is sort of unambiguously the 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 right uh, alternative solution here. Um, uh, but I, I do think that at the end of the day, um, the concern over the Chinese control over a, a profound point, uh, information um, infrastructure is certainly compelling, and I do think this is a, a reasonable way of dealing with that uh, with that problem. Thanks, so. I'm going to come back to Ramya. Yeah, so I mean, I, I completely agree with uh, Alan on the, the data privacy point. I think that the uh, reliance on data privacy as rationale is very weak. Um, protecting Americans' privacy is an interest of the highest order, but the way that you protect that interest is by passing a comprehensive data privacy law, not a TikTok ban, which uh, is frankly not just unnecessary, but but ineffective in, in actually achieving that interest, and the reason is the one that Alan mentioned, that the Chinese government simply doesn't need TikTok in order to be uh, able to purchase or access American sensitive data. It can easily get that data from data brokers and data aggregators on the open market. That's a, it's a real big problem, and I, I really hope that Congress takes up that, takes up that problem by, by passing a privacy rule, but a TikTok ban isn't going to do uh, very much there. Um, on, on disinformation, you know, again, I, 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 I think that a ban on TikTok is going to be ineffective. The truth is that foreign governments, China included, don't need to own or uh, own platforms in order to be able to spread uh, disinformation. Many foreign governments uh, have, have run disinformation campaigns on a variety of platforms, including American-owned ones. Um, obviously, that was the case with the 2016 Russian campaign on, on Facebook. 
so uh, so I'm not sure that banning TikTok is really going to be effective in, in addressing that interest, even if it was a permissible one. And I think that, that there's a real question mark over that, um, you know, for the reason uh, I mentioned before, which is that generally we don't like the government sort of controlling uh, the public's access uh, to ideas, including uh, app ideas and information and media from, from abroad. Um, you know, but the other thing that I, I would mention is, I, I guess I have some trouble with this assumption that sort of foreign, foreign speech is uniquely manipulative. Um, you know, dom domestic speech can be just as manipulative, just as pernicious, but we generally wouldn't accept restricting dom domestic speech on those grounds um, because we would rightly see sort of the potential for government abuse, the potential for the government to, uh, to use that as a cover to suppress ideas that it doesn't like. Um, and the sort of like prospect of distortion um, on one of the major sort of channels of communications that, uh, you know, Americans rely on. I mean, I, I acknowledge that it's a, it's, it's a sort of, um, it's a weighty concern, but it's not one that's limited to TikTok. Again, you know, it was not that long ago that people were talking about fears that um, a company like Facebook could swing an election, right? I mean, there was a study, I think, back from 2010 where uh, it was an internal experiment run by Facebook along with uh, researchers at a university. Um, and they ran an experiment on, on 61 million uh, people. They showed them uh, variations of a clickable um, uh, I vote button. And the result of that study was that, uh, or they concluded that uh, they had gotten uh, an additional 350 thousand, I think it was, Americans to the polls, which is, you know, a significant margin uh, and, and could be sort of the uh, the sort of like margin of victory in the kind of close elections that we're having. So, you know, this this isn't a uh, an issue that is limited to TikTok. I mean, I think that this problem flows from having a centralization of power in a handful of, you know, sort of um, for-profit companies, but I don't think, you know, we would uh, uh, accept the government sort of imposing a divestal ban or flat out ban on, on, on any of these companies um, simply because they control important channels of communication. I think that there are other better policy responses that would get at this sort of underlying problem of um, concentration of power in, in a handful of platforms over our public discourse. Sure. I agree with most of what you said. I think ultimately where this bill fails, intermediate scrutiny or strict scrutiny or anything that's subjected to you, is that a ban is just not effective to solve any of the problems that this bill is purporting to solve. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've talked at length about how every other social media company, these same problems are present. And so banning TikTok and TikTok alone is, is simply not effective. Can I say just something, one, one, just very quickly? So I agree with with Ramya that this would not fully solve the problem. And I agree with Ramya that other platforms have this problem as well. But I do think it's important to distinguish between the scale of the problem on something like TikTok, which again is controlled by ByteDance, which can be controlled completely if it wanted to be by the, or if the Chinese part, Communist Party wanted it to, and a platform like Facebook or X or YouTube or whatever, which while it has potential to be a vector for disinformation is not potentially under the control of a foreign government. And so I think just the scale of what you are potentially looking at is profoundly different. And I don't think that a law has to completely solve the problem um, at issue to pass constitutional uh, muster. And so I, I just I do think it's important to keep the scale of what we're talking about with TikTok versus other platforms in mind. Um, so let's go to the question about the national security argument. Uh, many courts, when reviewing this question in the TikTok bans that we've seen, have, uh, and the government has, in all those cases, submitted uh, secret evidence that has not been made public to, to us. But the courts have repeatedly concluded the government's claims were hypothetical, conjectural. Uh, and often, conjectural uh, claims of harm are not enough to justify a free speech burden. Uh, and so I'm just wondering how 
uh, this will play out in this case. You've got the government's claims of, of, of possibility. Alan just said, you know, the scale of uh, possible uh, manipulation of uh, the information environment in the United States by China, by the TikTok app, should potentially justify this. And so I want to I'll come back to, to Alan, but I think that's the, the, the question here. That is posed in the, it could possibly happen, uh, and uh, it, where the government hasn't yet uh, seemed to show that this is in fact occurring, even though the, as I did mention, <laughs> Congressman Gallagher does believe it's actually occurring today. Um, uh, let's go to Jenna. Yeah, I think we have not seen any evidence of a real threat right now. It is all hypothetical, and a, a hypothetical is not going to be enough to survive government scrutiny. But I think. What, what is really clear to me about this is that the government wants to go after China. They perceive that as being politically popular. They think that like going after China is how they're going to win the election. TikTok of all the apps has the closest ties to China. Therefore, we will ban TikTok, and that's how we we'll win our election. Uh, I think that's going to backfire. <laughs> I think half of the country uses TikTok. And I read an article recently that said it's actually the children of members of Congress who have been the best lobbyists for TikTok because they go and they beg their parents not to ban this app they use for so many protected speech activities. But yeah, we just simply don't have evidence that any of these threats are real, let alone rising to, you know, that imminent and severe standard that we think it'll be to rise to to pass a prior restraint analysis. It strikes me that, you know, I'd love to know how much of, how many people in the audience have TikTok on their phones. Who has TikTok in the phones? So uh, I'd say a distinct minority, maybe a third of you have TikTok on, on your phones. So um, I, it's fascinating. Uh, so Alan, uh, hypothetical, you pose a hypothetical. Uh, is that enough to get through this uh, substantial uh, intrusion upon uh, free expression? So I think it depends on what you mean by hypothetical. I, I fully concede that the nightmare scenario that is motivating supporters of this bill, that does appear to be hypothetical, which is, of course, what you would expect, right? If your concern is that um, this is kind of a ticking time bomb that China could use at a moment of high tension, you would expect China to wait to use that. Um, but then you are accepting that that is hypothetical. And that is, of course, a weakness in the government's case. On the other hand, if you look at, I think, the component pieces of that concern, they're anything but hypothetical. So, for example, we know that the Chinese government is extremely, extremely prickly, let's say, for lack of a better term, about um, how, you know, a, a, a prickly in terms of trying to control the kind of communications environment, not just within its own country, but outside. Right. So whether this is, you know, Hollywood changing how it makes movies so that it can then play them in the Chinese market or the, the Houston Rockets getting banned from Chinese television after the general manager tweeted something nice about the Hong Kong protests. Um, I think what's definitely not speculative is, again, China's willingness to throw its weight around um, to sh to change how other countries view it. Um, the other thing that's not speculative is the Chinese government's willingness to really, um, in an extremely heavy-handed way, control its major private companies. So Jack Ma, the Chinese billionaire and, and head of Alibaba, which is a, is a huge tech company, he basically disappeared for a while after saying some not nice things about Chinese government control over the economy. Um, during this disappearance, uh, the Chinese government basically forced off, forced a sale of a bunch of Alibaba's assets. Jack Ma has now reappeared, and he seems to be happy with everything. Um, so those things are not speculative. And so the question is, given what's not speculative, how, what, what's kind of the margin of additional speculativity um, to the nightmare <laughs> scenario? And again, I, I don't have I don't have an answer here, um, but I, I just want to emphasize that. Um, you know, it, it's not an either or that this is or is not a speculative threat. There's going kind to of nuance there. It's important. So coming back to the propaganda question, which seems to be the one that I think everyone agrees is the threat most likely to uh, to uh, be of uh, gravest concern here. In the 1960s, we have a Supreme Court precedent, uh, and that is the case of Lamont v. Postmaster General. 
There, the court ruled unanimously that regulations infringe that restricted the receipt of information from, uh, from China uh, infringed the recipient's First Amendment rights. That is, Mr. Lamont had the right to receive Chinese communist propaganda, literally the Peking Review at the time. Uh, so do TikTok users have a First Amendment right to receive foreign propaganda in, in the kind of worst case scenario as, as you described it? Uh, and I'm going to come back to Rania to, to lead us on. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer is obviously, obviously yes, based on, um, on, on the case Lamont, which is, you know, a case from the, the height of the Cold War, I might add. Um, and so in that case, you had... Uh, uh, a, a regulation that required Americans who wish to receive information that the government considered to be uh, communist propaganda, um, communist propaganda from abroad, that they had to send in a, a, an opt-in card um, uh, to uh, the post office saying, yes, please, I'd like to receive communist propaganda. And... Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, and the court saw through um, uh, this uh, registration requirement for what it was, which was a very significant burden on the First Amendment interests um, of, of Americans to receive ideas um, uh, and engage with those ideas, um, you know, from abroad. And it wasn't, um, uh, even though this registration requirement fell short of a ban, um, the court understood that uh, a, a requirement, that the requirement at issue would exert a very powerful chilling um, effect on Americans in this country and their right to hear. Um, and so it struck down uh, the law. And so I think if, you know, faithfully applying um, Lamont here, uh, you know, the TikTok ban is actually far more onerous. Um, obviously, there's the prospect of, of a ban. It wouldn't just be, you wouldn't just be registering um, with the government to uh, a, a sort of uh, engage on TikTok, though obviously that would raise very, very serious um, First Amendment concerns. Uh, and the government doesn't argue that everything on TikTok is, is disinformation. Yes, it argues that China um, could one day hijack TikTok's algorithm to to push this information, but as, as Jenna said, that, that, uh, that is a, um, an unsubstantiated uh, claim. And if the government has evidence of that, it should share it with the, it should share it with the public. And I, I mean, this brings me to my, um, I think the central point here, which is that even leaving to one side, generally speaking, you know, the court has held that uh, suppressing that the suppression of speech is not a permissible response um, to the problem of disinformation and that there are less restrictive means that the government um, ought to use before it goes there. Um, you know, and Jennifer mentioned one of these before uh, disclosure um, and, and that, that requirement, the disclosure requirement that the uh, Foreign um, Agents Registration Act uh, requires it requires uh, agents of foreign powers to register, and the court said, you know, um, that kind of requirement uh, requiring, uh, you know, certain uh, media to label themselves as propaganda. Yes, it does raise First Amendment concerns, um, but it is a less restrictive um, alternative to a flat out ban. And so, if the government uh, has uh, you know, evidence that TikTok is being used in the way it says uh, it, it could be, um, it should engage in its own counter speech. You know, generally speaking, the court has said the best uh, answer to bad speech is good speech. It's not enforced silence. And so it's not at all clear to me why you would um, throw away uh, that basic principle simply because we're dealing with foreign speech. And I think Lamont stands for the proposition that we shouldn't do that. So I just want to pick up on one part of that, which is um, in the 60s um, and then in, again in the 80s and 90s with the, uh, in, with the uh, Berman Amendment in particular and, and in the 60s with uh, Levant, you have this sense that, um, that 
uh, the people who want to allow this speech are very confident in the American people. Uh, that is, we can uh, receive foreign propaganda and manage it. Uh, and so, and this is what freedom means. Uh, it includes the freedom to receive prop foreign propaganda. There is a kind of brittleness uh, that is suggested. Now, now, Ramya, you did mention, you know, well, we can get people out to the polls uh, with these kinds of algorithmic uh, shifts. Um, but that's also a different, getting people to the polls is different than getting them to pull, pull a particular lever for one candidate or another. Uh, so, so, you know, and, and become suddenly communist or, or anti-communist. I don't, I, there's a kind of sense that manipulation is pretty easy to do um, and, uh, and that there might not be other means to respond to that manipulation. Uh, that uh, we shouldn't uh, consider. But I'm going to turn to Jennifer to pick up uh, on this question. So a, a lot of what Ramia said, I, I want to in some ways just say plus one. <laughs> I want to get a lot of what she said. But I also think it's important to reframe this conversation in the speech rights of TikTok's users. Oftentimes when we hear this debate about banning TikTok, it's seen as a debate over banning a large social media company. And in fact, I would argue that's one of the problems with our debate over technology and technology policy in general right now, is that we're thinking about these as large companies and not thinking about the millions of users who have found opportunities to have their voice in this way. And that particularly when we're talking about banning a particular platform, users have chosen that platform for a reason. They have many choices and they find that this is the one they like best, whether it's because of how they connect with an audience, whether it's because of the nature of how they consume content. There can be any reason that an individual user chooses one platform over the other. And many, if not most users, are using multiple platforms for their different speech needs. So I think we have to think about how this impacts users' speech, particularly in this context. And traditionally, our response as Americans, as was discussed, has been that the answer to speech that we're concerned about, whether it's propaganda or disinformation or, or anything else, is to engage in more speech, to trust that our fellow Americans will ultimately land on the truth and that we have those conversations, that we don't ban the speech instead. Great. Alan? Yeah, so I... I love to respond to the the great points that both Ramya and Jennifer made. So with respect to to what Ramya was arguing, so I, I agree that the case stands for the proposition that a blanket ban on foreign propaganda would be unconstitutional. I just wouldn't push that proposition farther than I think the court meant it. Um, this is not a blanket ban on Chinese propaganda. This does not ban the Peking Review. It does not pose any obstacle to the Peking Review, or I think it's called the Beijing Review these days. Um, if there really was a bill that tried to ban, literally, you know, ban Chinese propaganda, that would be blatantly unconstitutional, and I would very much oppose that. But I just don't think that's what this is. Um, this is a bill that would um, potentially ban Chinese control of a communications platform. And I think that control is actually much more insidious than straight up propaganda itself, because the whole point is, and I think, you know, wherever you fall on this debate, I think we all agree at this point that the power of social media to shape uh, how we perceive the very truth itself um, is profound. And so, um, uh, you know, when you think about what the First Amendment value underlying Lamont is, right, which is that we want more speech because that in the sort of marketplace of ideas presumably will lead to more truth. And, you know, people, some people might agree with the propaganda and other people might disagree and that will sharpen their own understanding of what's right. Um, I think if you take the concern of control over the medium itself and the ways that the social media algorithms and content moderation can um, manipulate perception without people even realizing it, um, uh, I don't think that, you know, the, the principle of Lamont gets you anywhere near uh, this case, though obviously it's it's relevant. Now, as to the point that Jennifer made about framing this as this the the speech interest of TikTok users, I I completely agree with that, and I do think that's something that gets lost frequently. And here, I think you have to sort of make a guess, frankly, about what would happen if TikTok was banned. Um, I do think that a lot of people uh, who are on TikTok TikTok they would find that extremely disruptive. I think that the uh, 
the kind of content creators on TikTok who have created a lot of content, have invested a lot of that, that would be a huge blow to them. And I don't want to minimize that. But I don't think that TikTok is irreplaceable. I think that the idea of short form video content with sort of algorithmic curation um, is well understood, very standardized. You have competitors. I think Instagram Reels is basically a competitor for TikTok. I, I just, I don't see a, a realistic possibility that the sorts of affordances that TikTok provides would not be fairly quickly replicated. Again, with disruption, I'm not denying that fact. Um, but I do think when you're thinking about, you know, how would this leave the speech interests of U.S. Uh, social media users, I think that within a fairly short time, you would have just as much social media content, including TikTok style content as before. Okay, so I want to turn now to the audience for uh, your questions. Uh, I'll turn to this gentleman up front first. Uh, there is a mic. Yeah. One of you mentioned that the law, although in some ways generic, also uh, singles out TikTok explicitly in the text of the law. Does that itself raise a constitutional question that it is not a generic uh, act, but that it singles out one corporation? So let's take a couple questions. Um, and we'll go with the woman right here in the blue. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I didn't think I would ever ask that question, but I have to. What is the difference between uh, prohibiting us from screaming fire in a crowded theater that I would think it would produce a lot less harm to the society and basically allowing TikTok to produce something of a much bigger nature. Thank you. And let's, uh, let's ask the question. Well, thank you. I have two questions. The first is in 2020, after violent clash uh, uh, between India and China, India immediately su suddenly you know, banned you know, the TikTok. So I'm just wondering, if our panels can compare between you know Indian and US in terms of their respective ban on TikTok. That's the first question. The second question is uh, there are speculations that in the aftermath of the TikTok, the US might you know further target some other Chinese app like Timu and Xinyin, uh, which are the two most influential, like Professor uh, Chandler mentions a Gen Z style e-commerce platform uh, run here in the United States from China as well. Um, so if that were the case, um, what would be the you know the possible you know rationale from the US? I uh, just want to know our panelists' perspective. Great. Um, let's uh, we'll take some more another do another round. Uh, and let me begin with Alan. Alan, would you like to respond to any of those questions? Uh, uh, singles out TikTok, uh, this is like this is much worse than fire in a crowded theater. If we can uh, regulate that, questions about that. Uh, Jeff sure. Kosliff is rolling, is rolling <laughs> yeah. over right yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, but uh, uh, then we should certainly go and do this. India banned TikTok. What, what, it, what does that teach us? And um, is this just the first app to roll? Are there other heads that will roll as well? Sure. So you know, Jeff, to take, you know, to answer all of them. Just I, I won't. I won't. So yeah. Jeff Kossif is a friend of mine, and and he would uh, break up with me his friendship if if I did not address the 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 fire in a crowded theater. I mean, the whole point of that issue is that sometimes you can yell fire in a crowded theater. Sometimes you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. The whole question is, um, how imminent would the harm be? And I think I mentioned this because that's in a sense a lot of what we've been talking about here. Um, uh, I tend to think that the magnitude of that harm would be enormous potentially if China wanted to use the control it has over TikTok. But again, as we've talked about, in a sense, that is somewhat speculative, right? More speculative, let's say, than what would happen if you literally yelled fire in a crowded theater and caused a stampede. And so the question here, and I don't pretend I have an opinion, but I don't pretend to have a, an answer, is, um, is this threat too speculative, right? I don't think it is, because I think when you disaggregate it, um, it's no longer particularly speculative. Um, but you know, to be to be honest here, um, it is in fact the case that the nightmare scenario is still speculative. Um, as to the last question about is this the only uh, communications uh, you know platform that might be affected? No, right? I mean, this could potentially apply to a bunch of other uh, Chinese owned or Chinese controlled uh, apps. Um, 
I do think that you do have to evaluate the merits um, of each case somewhat separately. Um, you, know, you have to ask questions like, um, what is the potential for whether it's data privacy infringements or for you know, misinformation? Um, that may be different for TikTok than for WeChat than for an e-commerce platform. You have to ask questions to Jennifer's point about the rights of users. What are the alternatives here, right? Again, I tend to think that there are much more richer alternatives to something like, let's say, TikTok than perhaps to something like WeChat, which really is one of the main ways in which um, uh, Chinese Americans uh, you know, communicate with Chinese, let's say, family members back in China. So I do think you would have to identify, you'd have to you know, analyze kind of each case a little bit on its own. And so I, I don't want to, um, I don't want my argument in defense of this bill as applied to TikTok to necessarily uh, be extended to every other possible sort of Chinese owned or Chinese controlled uh, platform. Thanks, Alan. Uh, let me be with Jenna. I think the question that I want to answer is about banning other apps. And like I said earlier, what this bill does is it says that the president can unilaterally ban other apps from foreign adversaries that are you know, partially owned by foreign adversaries, right? Um, and that is ripe for abuse. I am imagining President Trump coming in, and if a president of a company says something that he doesn't like about them, he is going to ban that company in the U.S. And therefore, any you know, any time a U.S. user relies on a company, it could be gone, you know, pretty quickly because they've done something to anger the president. I think this just puts too much control in the power of the president with no one else. Again, there's no due process here. There's like no way to fight this. There's there's notice and that's it, right? And so I think that's something that we should be concerned about. Those are really broad new powers that we're bestowing, you know, just kind of at the end of a bill that's purportedly about TikTok. Rania? Yeah, uh, you know, I guess the first part I'd be, um, in response to the sort of mention of, of India is I think that a real concern that a lot of us have about um, this uh, ban on TikTok is that it's going to, that if passed, will be a, a, a real gift to authoritarian regimes around the world that will use this as, as precedent to ban uh, foreign media in, in their countries. You know, in uh, previously, the U.S. has has criticized, has been rightly vocal when when other countries have banned their citizens' access to uh, foreign media, foreign social media in, in those countries. And I think it would um, no longer have the credibility to to do that um, going forward. I mean, we've already uh, you know seen. Obviously, India has already banned uh, TikTok. Um, uh, but for very recently, I mean, I think Israel is planning to ban Al Jazeera on the grounds of national security grounds. I mean, I think that these examples sort of raise this sort of broader concern about investing just sort of far reaching national security discretion in the executive. Even if you trust the current executive, imagine a future executive that you might not trust. <laughs> yeah. Jennifer? I, I also kind of want to pick up on the, the two questions about India or other countries having banned this app, as well as what this might mean more broadly. I think in addition to what's already been said about the concerns that this has of what this means for countries that are looking for an opportunity to perhaps force divest or ban on other media uh, apps, including potentially American media apps in some scenarios, you know, how would we feel about an authoritarian regime? using this as an excuse to, to ban American apps. Um, but I also think it's important to recognize that the First Amendment is largely unique. What we will not tolerate with regards to government intervention into speech is distinct from other countries' views of free speech and free expression. And that matters a lot. I think that's a good thing, but it also means that we can't just say country X did it and it didn't have legal scrutiny there, therefore why is it a problem in the US? because we do have this standard of the First Amendment that requires different elements when it comes to government intervention in speech. In addition to what's already been said about how this does best broad power in the executive, I think it's also important to note that this isn't just a China bill either, that there are other countries that are named in the bill and other countries that could be added to the foreign adversary list. And so this also not only has to be thought about what does this mean for 
the for some of the apps that were mentioned, but what does this mean more generally for the way the U.S. may interact with with other countries? So one of the apps that I watch that I think gets very little attention in the United States is um, is Telegram, uh, which has uh, is a Russian origin app uh, and is very popular in certain parts of the United States. And I, I'm going to go further than uh, what Jenna said. Jenna worried about a Trump too, uh, but I think you know uh, Telegram often uh, skews to the far right. You can easily imagine uh, the president on the other side saying this is uh, you know kind of uh, supercharging uh, hate speech, etc. In the United States, and therefore should be banned, and therefore. Uh, 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 threat to national security and so forth. So I think there's there's that, and I certainly uh, when it plus one to the idea of uh, borrowing from India's example. Uh, India's uh, response was in in a context of a literal uh, a battle in the Himalayas where Indian soldiers fell to their deaths, um, and so I think that was a, a totally unique uh, environment in which to. Uh, to respond in different ways. And India chose to respond in this, what the minister at that time called a digital strike against China, which is much better than a kinetic strike against China. So let, I want to say that was actually a moderate response in, in those kind of circumstances. Okay, uh, now I want to turn to Guzo and give the floor to Guzo to ask uh, questions from the uh, online audience. Yes, many, many callers uh, with questions here. Uh, I'm going to try to run through a few so you can have an idea of the commentary that is uh, popping up online. Um, first, in regards to like the homework of the government, um, any, any sense on why the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States uh, never ended up assigning public servants as board members of the um, United States Digital Service as part of Project Texas. And in that sense, is there, um, uh, what is your view on, on an effort of actually making, you know, the propaganda and, and manipulation more evidence-based, more uh, show, showing uh, that case? Uh, another question in regards to that as well is, um, uh, how does how is this different from uh, the Com Committee on Foreign Investment uh, forcing Chinese company Kunlun's divestment of Grinder in 2020? Um, other questions go about uh, the idea of this the the theater. Uh, can you explain a little bit better on how um, what's the difference between uh, uh, of banning free speech if you have other options to express your free speech online using other apps and other uh, mechanisms as well. Um, another question here is how would the Supreme Court cases like net neutrality and Chevron contribute to the uh, evidence uh, on, on, on these arguments? Uh, and what are the lines between public safety and health and free, free expression in this case? Um, finally, uh, um, yeah, I think this is a good uh, picture of, of the entire thing. Thank you for summarizing very, very uh, pithily uh, five uh, big questions. Uh, so let's just I'll summarize those questions again uh, very quickly. Uh, the question being, uh, well, CFIUS never uh, followed through on certain aspects of Project Texas where there might be public servants that are assigned to monitor what USDS, US data services, the TikTok arm that controls the data and the algorithm. Uh, and maybe that might have mitigated some of those propaganda concerns that have been described earlier. Uh, so why didn't that transpire in that way and, and essentially kind of largely address those concerns or at least mitigate those concerns? Uh, uh, in 2018, the U.S. government ordered the divestiture by Quinlan of the uh, dating app Grindr, uh, and a year later, Grindr did, in fact, uh, was sold to another company. Uh, so maybe that's a precedent that should be, uh, that serves, uh, how is that dis different 
and what's going on here. Um, uh, uh, the the uh, the fire in the crowded theater question, uh, and uh, and there are being other alternatives to express yourself um, in, in this uh, than than use TikTok. So perhaps it's not such a huge burden after all. Uh, what what is what do we can we what is the net neutrality uh, debate teach us about this question? And what about the public safety, public health arguments against TikTok? Uh, so many of, if you watch the show two hearings, many of the people said this is leading our kids to drugs and uh, and other ills. Uh, and so this is a kind of one way ratchet that the Chinese government is uh, leading our kids like the Pied Piper to their doom. Uh, and so, uh, so I'll open up those many questions, interesting questions to all of you. Let me begin with Jenna. Sure, I will tackle a couple of them quickly. One is I don't think TikTok is that easily replaceable. I've talked to a lot of small business owners who say that they were never able to get their small business up and running with a different app. It just, it didn't work the same. They weren't able to reach the same audience. So for so many people, this is their actual livelihood that's at stake. And, you know, like earlier, Alan was saying, sure, this would be a hit. For people, when their income is hit, that is not something that you can easily recover from, even if it's only a temporary hit, having no income for months. I mean, for some people, that is the difference between having a home and having food on the table and not, right? So we really can't underestimate the fact that TikTok is not so easily replaceable, especially for the people who are relying on it for their income. Uh, the second question I want to tackle is the net neutrality question, because that's the other thing I've spent my whole week working on. Uh, <laughs> it's also part of my portfolio. You know, I think in both cases, what net neutrality does is it says that Internet service providers cannot treat different Internet traffic differently. They can't decide what is sped up, what is slowed down. They can't block some things. And I mean, that's the same, right? The reason that net neutrality is happening is to protect the ability of users to go on, do what they want to do online. And this is the same. Right now, half of the country wants to use TikTok. And so to ban TikTok, that's really going against the core of net neutrality, which is to make sure that users can access the information online that they want to access. And the difference is from net neutrality is what internet service providers are dictating that you know constituents are, are accessing. In this case, it's the government, which is obviously has an even bigger implication for the First Amendment. Um, there was one other question that I wanted to answer. Oh, harm to kids. So, <laughs> you know, I think one thing that, because I also work on a lot of kids' online safety, is that the government does not talk about the actual benefits of social media to kids. For all of the harms that exist, ultimately, social media has changed the game for kids in a lot of really positive ways. You know, I'm at the ACLU. We have a big focus on equity. We have a whole team that focuses on LGBTQ issues. One thing that you know, you'll hear a lot is people who say, if the internet had existed when I was a kid, I wouldn't have felt like the only gay kid in the world, right? Kids who live in places where there aren't others like them have been able to find that information, find resources, explore themselves, find a sense of community, not feel so alone. Kids that are bullied will often say the internet is what they turn to because that's where they find friends, that's where they find people. In so many cases, the internet is made out to be this horrible risk for kids. And sure, these harms, I will not you know, they exist, they absolutely exist, but there's a lot of good that happens as well. And, you know, I think policymakers jump to regulating the internet because that's easier, right? It's much easier for them to regulate the internet than to invest money in education and digital literacy, than to invest money in law enforcement, to go after people that are selling drugs and abusing children. Like, there's so many other things that the government can do that are bigger and harder, and that's why it's easier for them to do it. Let's hold Facebook, TikTok, Instagram accountable here for every harm that's ever happened to kids. Thank you. Ramya? So uh, I might try and take one of the questions that hasn't already been addressed, the first one about you know, CPS and potentially getting the US government more involved in, uh, in audit, auditing, having oversight over uh, TikTok's algorithm as a way to uh, protect against the possibility of you know, Chinese co-optation and um, disinformation. Uh, so I'm not sure why that proposal didn't quite work out, but I'm pre I'm pretty glad it didn't <laughs> because you know I think the prospect of having really close U.S. government entanglement um, in you know in sort of reviewing and having having veto power over the 
um, content moderation, sort of like policy making, um, but also, you know, algorithmic decisions of a, of a social media company are, are a little bit concerning. Um, you know, third party oversight might ameliorate some of those issues, but, but having US public servants directly involved in that way, I think, raises some pretty significant um, you know, free speech concerns. But this brings me to sort of one of the other sort of less restrictive alternatives that I think the government should act, you know, should very, should very much turn to in sort of addressing the risk of disinformation, not only by um, the Chinese government, but other foreign adversaries as well, it is requiring greater transparency of the platforms and potentially imposing obligations on them to share data with independent researchers who study problems like the spread of disinformation uh, on the platforms. You know, a point that, uh, uh, you know, renowned uh, cybersecurity expert, uh, uh, Bruce Schneier made in his affidavit in support of uh, uh, a lawsuit challenging the application of Texas's TikTok ban to the public university faculty context is actually researchers, if they had access to this data, would pretty quickly realize if the Chinese government were involved in such a monumental effort to, um, to sort of uh, hijack TikTok's algorithm to push this information. So that could act as a significant bulwark of, against that kind of effort. And so um, transparency would have a lot of, you know, I think uh, socially uh, valuable sort of um, uses, but that is one of them. Great, and I always, yeah. So um, the possibility of researcher access to data that can help us determine whether or not propaganda is being pushed would seem to be one of the measures that might mitigate these risks. So I'm always surprised that that isn't one of the things that rolled out as the first uh, uh, approach to these questions. Uh, uh, Jennifer. So I want to turn to the, the CFIUS question a little bit and then also get to the, the kids question. Um, so with CFIUS and particularly with Scipius and Grinder, I think this also shows what another kind of unusual element of this bill and that there was a process in place for considering these questions. The Scipius process has been ongoing that should be, you know, weighing the potential risk, considering what these alternatives are and building a case if any steps are needed with regards to concerns about national security and this foreign investment. That's a little bit distinguished from what we distinct from what we have here, which are as as we talked about in some of the other elements of this panel, what are very vague national security concerns. Still, with the the case of Grinder, there were some very specific elements about with with regards to the LGBTQ community that were discussed in that decision. With this, it's kind of more much more amorphous about what the concern actually is, as we've already said several times on this panel which in some ways segues to this question about kids online. And I think we have to recognize that the TikTok debate, while there is a TikTok debate going on, is also part of a broader debate. And like Jenna, I'm very concerned with some of what we're hearing in terms of age verification, age appropriate design codes, all sorts of calls to ban children from social media when there are so many beneficial uses and when there's not always clear evidence of the harm, let alone clear definitions of what harm we're trying to solve when we say we want to keep kids safe online. At the end of the day, when it comes to kids' online safety, I think it should be parents, not policymakers, making those decisions, because there are going to be so many different options in so many different households that are going to fit so many different situations, because we don't necessarily agree on what the problem is, and that makes it a bad place to try and have a one-size-fits-all policy. Thank you. Alan? I know we're out of time, so I'm I'm happy to cede my time. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, I think we actually covered all of those uh, those wonderful questions. Uh, thank you all. Uh, please join me in thanking our group. So, uh, we will post this on YouTube, and uh, thank you all very much.